<laughs> I'm going to try again. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northfield. My name is Bill Jokola. Mary Jane and I have been part of this wonderful community for almost eight years. UUFN is an inclusive community that nurtures spiritual and intellectual growth and fosters ethical and social responsibility. If you are a visitor, either on site or online, we are glad you're with us and we invite you to stay after the service to get acquainted. We welcome your questions and look forward to getting to know you. I call your attention to the announcements in the order of service and your weekly email. There you'll find more information about the following. Child dedications are planned for May 19th. Infants and older children are invited to be dedicated and welcomed into our community. Sign up via the online form by May 12th. Contact Larry Vorwerk for a special tour of the Minnesota Zoo on Saturday, April 20th. Larry served as a zookeeper there for 39 years. The UU Mid-America Regional Assembly is Friday, April 19th and Saturday, April 20th, online and in Madison, Wisconsin. A link to register is in the reach. Next Sunday, April 21st, after the service, John Owens and Mary Jane Lipinski will offer an introductory Enneagram session. The Enneagram is a system for better understanding personality. Later in the service today, we will take our share of the plate offering as a way to care for the wider world. This month's share of the plate recipient is Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. This organization works in partnership with multi-faith communities across the state to co-create a just, just and a sustainable world by addressing the climate crisis. The green team here at UUFN chose Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light as our share of the plate recipient for April in honor of Earth Day. UUFN is using Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light to provide local legislative action opportunities to supplement the UUA Green Sanctuary Program, moving UUFN forward to live our faith and values through effective and sustained action on climate justice. Thank you for giving as you are willing and able. We have one final announcement in honor of Earth Day. Saturday, April 27th, people in Northfield will celebrate Earth Day. The green team invites you to take action. One action is to minimize your use of plastics and then recycle what you can. In addition to cans, jars, paper, cartons, bottles, and plastic containers, we encourage you to recycle your plastic bags and stretchy plastic film, such as newspaper sleeves. Cub Foods accepts plastic bags and film plastic. Plastic bags can be dropped off at Family Fair and Target. An even better shopping option is to use cloth or reusable shopping bags or containers and to avoid the use of plastic bags as much as possible. Only 9% of plastic produced is recycled. According to Consumer Reports, in 2018, 75% of plastic ended up in landfills. These eventually break down into microplastics which pollute air, water, and soil and are harmful when ingested. Some alarming statistics. There could be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. Also at that time, 99% of seabirds will be eating plastic. We can do better every day is Earth Day. Reduce, recycle, reuse, and reprioritize how you use plastic in your home. Join us next Sunday for Unconditional Love with a Few Conditions, <laughs> presented by Ellen Saul and Nita Wolf. Ellen will share ideas from her newly published book, From Pain to Power, Seven Steps to Healthy Boundaries, and Nita will share ideas on the many forms of love and acceptance. 
Again, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northfield. beautiful journey. Our opening words are from Helen Keller. Smell is a potent wizard that transports us across thousands of miles in all the years we have lived. The odors of fruits waft me to my southern home, to my childhood frolics in the peach orchard. Other odors, instantaneous and fleeting, cause my heart to dilate joyously or contract with remembered grief. Even as I think of smells, my nose is full of scents that start awake sweet memories of summers gone and ripening fields far away. Come, let us worship together.
The flaming chalice is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Each Sunday when we gather, we bring this symbol to life together. Please join me in speaking the words for the lighting of the chalice. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Please rise in body or spirit. For hymn number 175, we celebrate the web of life. To begin our exploration of the sensory world of animals, I want to share a story based on the introduction of the book An Immense World by Ed Yong. The picture on our order of service represents the characters in our story. Imagine that there are 10 beings living in a large room, a mouse, a robin, an owl, a bat, a rattlesnake, a spider, a mosquito, a bumblebee, an elephant, and a female human. As they smell the space around them, they take in the floating scents. The elephant sniffs nothing of note. The rattlesnake detects the trail of the mouse. The mosquito smells the alluring carbon dioxide of the human's breath and the aroma of her skin. The mosquito lands on the human's arm, but before it can bite, she swats it away. Her slap disturbs the mouse. It squeaks in alarm, but at a pitch that is audible to the bat, but too high for the elephant to hear. The elephant unleashes a deep, thunderous rumble, too low pitched for the mouse's ears or the bat's, but felt by the vibration sensitive belly of the rattlesnake. The human is oblivious to both the ultrasonic mouse squeaks and the infrasonic elephant rumbles, but listens intently to the singing of the robin. However, the human's hearing is too slow to pick out all the complexities that the bird encodes within its tune. The human's eyes are the sharpest in the room. Unlike the elephant or the bee, the human can spot the small spider sitting upon its web until the lights go out. As the mouse skitters between the human's feet, its footsteps are too faint for her to hear, but they are easily audible to the owl perched overhead. The disc of stiff feathers on the owl's face funnels sounds towards its sensitive ears, one of which is slightly higher than the other. Thanks to this asymmetry, the owl can pinpoint the source of the mouse's skittering in both the vertical and horizontal planes. Using two pits on its snout, the rattlesnake can sense the infrared radiation that emanates from a warm object. It effectively sees in heat, and the mouse's body blazes like a beacon. All of this goes unnoticed by the spider, which barely hears or sees the other creatures. Its world is almost entirely defined by the vibrations coursing through its web. When the mosquito strays into the silken strands, the spider detects the vibrations and moves in for the kill. As it attacks, it is unaware of the high frequency sound waves that are hitting its body and bouncing back to the bat. The bat's sonar is so acute that it not only finds the spider in the dark, but pinpoints it precisely enough to pluck it from the web. 
As the bat feeds, the robin feels the familiar attraction that most of the other animals cannot sense, the Earth's magnetic field. Guided by its internal compass, it leaves to migrate to a warmer southern climate. These creatures share the same physical space, but experience it in wildly and wondrously different ways. The same is true for the billions of other animal species on the planet. Earth teems with sights and textures, sounds and vibrations, smells and tastes, electric and magnetic fields, but every animal can only tap into a small fraction of reality's fullness. Each is enclosed within its own unique sensory bubble, perceiving but a tiny sliver of an immense world. I invite you to allow yourself an unhurried breath. Relax your shoulders, inhale and exhale, and let your heart catch up with you in this moment. Rest in the embrace of a wider love. In the presence of this love that holds us all, we use our chalice flame to light our candles of community. We light our first candle as a blessing for the wider world. We mourn for all those whose lives are torn apart by violence and death in Gaza and Israel, and all those who love them. We pray for peace. We pray for an end to anti-Semitism. We pray for an end to the salt on brown bodies in Palestine and around the world. We pray for a ceasefire. We know too that the details of our daily lives are sacred and important. We now light a candle for all the simple joys that are sustaining us. And we light another candle in honor of the sorrows and hardships we might be carrying that have not been spoken aloud and we move into a time of silence. May the truth of your heart be reflected in these flames. Amen and blessed be. Good morning. I'm Larry Vowork, and I've been a member here for eight years or more. And today I'm talking about our opportunity for survival with deeper relationships with other life forms. This is our inner connection with respect and appreciation. We are living in a time where many have forgotten our true inner connection with all of life. 
Because of this, we are destroying our environment with many species becoming threatened or going extinct. Some stories of old tells us of our domination over other species. And this has taken us down a path of disconnection and destruction. In truth, all of life is interconnected and are one. All life has consciousness. The only difference between species are the levels or states of consciousness, regardless if they are plants, animals, or humans. This includes senses that, are, that they most heavily rely on the most. I will share a few personal examples of how humans and animals can interact with each other with greater awareness for the good of the whole. In the levels of consciousness, many species of animals have senses that are more enhanced than our own. We have heard stories of birds of prey being able to see a mouse up to a mile away. Even our pet dogs view their world mainly through their sense of smell. When walking along a nature trail, our dogs have to stop and smell who had been there before them. This tells them more than we could ever expect from our own sense of smell. This tells them many species of bats catch their prey of insects in the dark by echolocation. We all have our own special senses that enhance our survival, as well as our experience of life here on this earth. Regardless of which senses are more enhanced in different species, it is important to be able to understand and communicate with each other. In doing so, we more likely will be able to appreciate and live together in harmony. Many species of animals can communicate and show their own appreciation to us in ways we may never have considered. We have all heard of dolphins and whales who will acknowledge their appreciation of being freed from fishing nets or other forms of pollution in our seas. They will swim back to their human rescuer and give out a whistle of appreciation. But it can go much further than that with other animals. Many of you know that I was a zookeeper and zoologist during my adult career that was mostly at the Minnesota Zoo. During those years of working with different species of animals, I have been able to communicate at a deeper level with some of them. This has been a two-way street. Here is one example. At the Minnesota Zoo, we have Asian tapirs that are mammals that weigh about 600 pounds. From time to time, we need to collect blood from them or do other minor procedures. As zookeepers we, who regularly care for them, we build up a trusting and respectful relationship with each other. When a minor procedure is needed with one of these animals, one of us would go into the holding area with this animal. For example, we would talk softly to taper while slowly stroking it with a long-handled large brush. This would enable the animal to go into a stupor type of calming state. In time, the animal would then lay down on its side. At that time, the keeper would continue to stroke its belly while a vet would come into the holding area. The vet would then, would the vet would then pull blood or examine the animal more closely. As the procedure is finished, the vet and keeper would leave. Afterwards, the taper would be given a food treat, which would usually be a banana. They love bananas. Also, hand strokes and words of appreciation are given. One of the main reasons why I bring this up is that we wouldn't need to give this animal a form of an anesthetizing drug, which always comes to a risk of the animal. Here's another example I just heard about recently. Quote, several years ago, I found the grandparents of this wild kingfisher nearly dead in my garden. After nursing it back to health, I released it into the wild. The next morning, the bird family swooped down past me in a gesture of gratitude. A couple of years later, I woke up to find the next generation, a parent of this bird, waiting for me on the terrace with what appeared to be a broken wing. When I picked him up for examination, he remained calmed and looked deeply into my eyes. A thorn had jammed his wing, preventing it from moving. After I removed it, I released it back into the wild. Ever since then, he flies past my window every day at the same time, calling out to me. 
Recently, this baby bird sat in a tree, locking eyes with me before flying directly to my hand. It stayed there for several minutes before flying away. Our connection was built on intuition, compassion, and good intentions. The essence of love, pure and unspoken. This is an energy without end, silently passing onward, reaching much further than we can imagine. As we become more aware of our interconnection with other animals and other life forms, we will find ways to heal our planet with closer and greater connection with each other. This will bring us greater joy and a sense of well being with all creatures. I might end, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'll be giving a tour at the zoo this Saturday, and uh, we'll be seeing these tapers that I talked about in this uh, story. And I have many other stories of connecting with animals that will be fine to share with you after the service if interested or at the zoo. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We will now take our offering. Our offering is one way we make our care for the world tangible. This month's Share the Plate recipient is Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. This organization works in partnership with multi-faith communities across the state to co-create a just and sustainable world by addressing the climate crisis. You may donate by cash, check made out to UUFN with offering basket in the memo line or online from our website, uunorthfield.org. You can scroll down to the bottom of the homepage for the link. We now gratefully accept the offering. Let us pick up our story where we left off with 10 creatures who shared the same physical space but experienced it in very different ways. Each animal could only tap into a small fraction of the sights, textures, sounds, vibrations, smells, and tastes that surrounded them. Each was enclosed within its own unique sensory bubble, perceiving but a tiny sliver of an immense world. I love that line. That story is but one of thousands that Ed Yong tells about the other living beings who share our interconnected web of existence. To understand just how differently animals interact with this world, I will tell a few more stories using a mix of Yang's words and my own. Let's start with bats. Most of the 1400 species of bats use echolocation to understand their environment, which serves a similar function to our human sight. But bats aren't just looking at the world or sensing what's already there. Rather, they send out a sound and scan for how the sound rebounds, which allows them to understand their environment and detect danger or dinner. They can identify a small moth that is 10 yards away. The closest human behavior I could think of was when the mothers of my childhood would yell for their child from the front stoop. There was a limit to how far away you could be and still hear them because sound loses energy as it travels through the air. The same is true for the bats. So they send out their calls at a volume of 138 decibels which is roughly as loud as a jet engine or a siren. Luckily for humans, the frequency of their screams is too high for our ears to detect. But echolocation only works if the bats themselves can hear the frequency and can handle the, that jet engine volume over and over again. 
The secret feature that they have is a muscle in their inner ear, which closes to protect their ears when they shout and then releases in time for them to hear the echo in return. Another amazing animal is the octopus. An octopus's central nervous system has about 500 million neurons, which is way beyond all other invertebrates and is comparable to small mammals. About two thirds of those neurons are in their eight arms and the neurons in the arms operate with their own ganglia cluster of neurons that can make decisions based on what the arm is sensing without checking with the central brain. As a result, all eight arms can operate independently from each other based on the decision making of their own set of neurons. Each arm has several hundred suckers and the rim of each of those sucker has thousands of mechanoreceptors to process touch and chem chemoreceptors to process taste. Imagine that our fingertips could both touch our food and taste it before deciding whether to move it to our mouth. <laughs> I would probably eat less. <laughs> the story that most enlarged my perspective of our immense world was Yang's description of the tree hoppers, which are insects no bigger than a stink bug. They are similar to mosquitoes in that they have mouth parts that allow them to penetrate tree bark and they use saliva to keep the tree from defending itself and closing up the hole. They may suck the sap of a tree for up to a month and they cause damage to many crops and horticultural plants such as citrus, avocado, and maples. From our point of view, they are pests. From their point of view, they are just trying to survive. In Yang's book, he doesn't say a word about their impact on agriculture. Instead, he tells the story of how the tree hoppers communicate by sending vibrations through the plant on which they stand. He described a mother tree hopper on the bottom of a leaf surrounded by her babies, each of them with black backs that he described as looking like Elvis's hair. Yang described a scientist clipping a microphone to the plant and then flicking the leaf. As the baby tree hoppers ran away, they produced vibrations by contracting the muscles in their abdomens. Converting that vibration into sound gave the humans a window into the world of the tree hoppers. The scientist was expecting a scurrying sound, but instead it sounded like cows mooing. It was deep and resonant, and you can hear it on YouTube if you're interested. After a few minutes, the babies returned to their mother and their sounds became less chaotic and turned into what he described as a synchronized chorus. And then the scientist unclipped the microphone and heard nothing. He could still see them, but they lived silent lives, at least to us. Yang's stories were meticulously researched and poetically told. I felt like I was hearing about the world from each animal's point of view, which maximized my ability to understand the world beyond what I can sense. It's one thing to embrace the interconnected web that we can define, and it's yet another thing to realize how little we know about the breadth of experiences of other inhabitants of this planet. As I was reading Yang's book, it was clear that many of the stories and sensory adaptations have one of three purposes, finding food, avoiding predators, or procreation. In other words, either individual survival or survival of your species. A very basic reality is that much of the interdependence of all existence is about those three things. Sometimes a creature is a predator and sometimes it is prey. Every organism plays a crucial role in maintaining ecological balance. The mosquito needs the human. The spider needs the mosquito. The bat needs the spider. The owl and the rattlesnake need the mouse, and so on. The web of life is an intricate network of relationships between all living things. But it is also painfully true that humans do things that are either knowingly or unconsciously over impacting our animal neighbors. Over the past month, I've noticed that my social media feed has had stories about a whale that was entwined in a fishing net, a baby dolphin who was starving because its snout was held closed by a plastic ring from a beverage, beverage container, other sea creatures with plastic in their stomachs, an owl that was dying after eating a poisoned mouse, and several dogs who were left abandoned or recovering from abuse. There are many impacts on animals where the time between a human action and the impact on the animal is long enough for us to avoid feeling personally responsible. There are also some actions where humans do have some sense of our impact. But I suspect that all of those together pale in comparison to other risks that we create for animals 
as a result of lack of understanding of their sensory experiences. The net result is a large degree of negligence by humans in not taking animals' needs into consideration. One behavior that humans do to animals frequently is to barrage them with stimuli that we create and which they wouldn't choose, and which sometimes can be quite harmful to them. Experts describe this as sensory pollution. I'd like to share two of Yang's examples that involve lighting. The first is set in the parking lot at the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. As we know, insects are attracted to streetlights. We may not know or we may not think about the fact that they hover below the lights until they exhaust themselves. Some types of bats take advantage of this all-you-can-eat buffet, if you will, but other smaller brown bats in the Grand Tetons were avoiding the lights in order to stay safe from owls. The darker habitat that they required was developing a shortage of insects, so the brown bat population was declining. A scientist got permission to study the impact of replacing the 32 street lights in that parking lot with lights that can change color. He and his team tagged the bats to track their behavior and used bags under the lights to count the insects that were attracted when the light was white versus red. Over a number of experiments and trials over time, they proved that the red lights don't attract as many insects, thereby benefiting the animals. They also noted that the lower brightness of these lights also make it possible for humans to see the Milky Way. Scientists estimate that light pollution means that over 80% of Americans no longer live in places where the Milky Way is visible. <clears throat> Another example of unintended consequences is the tribute in light in New York City. To commemorate the terrorist attacks of 9-11, an art installation was created in the location where the Twin Towers used to be. For seven days surrounding September 11th, 44 xenon bulbs, each of which produces 7,000 watts of light, produce two vertical beams of intense blue light that can be seen from 60 miles away. It's a beautiful way to honor those who died. Unfortunately, it's also a hazard for migrating birds. In the fall, billions of small songbirds migrate south in such high density that they show up on radar. Scientists from Oxford University and the Cornell Lab analyzed the radar and concluded that over a million birds were being affected over the seven nights of the tribute in light. They were getting caught in the light, circling slowly and calling out intensely. Some crashed and many were significantly, perhaps fatally weakened as they continued their grueling migration. When Larry and I talked about his experiences as a zookeeper, he mentioned that red-headed woodpeckers are nearly extinct because of how humans have affected their food supply. He explained that red-headed woodpeckers are very good at catching insects in flight. And unlike other types of woodpeckers, they prefer that approach overeating insects and decaying trees. Ed Yong mentioned that pesticides impact the olfactory communication of insects, which impedes their ability to find a mate. Insects make up 90% of all animal species and are the bottom of the food chain that feeds other animals. They also serve as pollinators, they break down materials such as feces, and as a result of light pollution, pesticides, and insecticides, the insect population is dramatically reduced and about 40% of insect species are at risk of extinction. The red-headed woodpecker is one of the species that has been adversely affected by this reduction of insects. And finally, we all know that a portion of the animal agriculture industry takes a dehumanizing approach to the animals. And by the way, I tried to find another word to describe the way we disregard the consciousness of animals. The English language doesn't seem to have a word for that. It's not quite right to say we objectify them or imprison them when we raise them for food production. Dehumanize is the closest to the sentiment that I am feeling. In the 17th century, the philosopher and priest Nicholas Malebranche wrote that animals eat without pleasure, cry without pain, grow without knowing it. They desire nothing, they fear nothing, they know nothing. Most people today would acknowledge that mammals feel pain or at the very least have sensory systems that respond to negative stimuli. In other words, they record pain. Interestingly, I could find no reference in Yang's book to animal agriculture. I suspect that in a book where he treats each species with so much respect and curiosity, it would be too hard to think about the cruelty of the small and dirty stalls for many meat animals and the speed with which a cow who has given birth is inseminated again in order to maximize her output, 
humans seem to feel that we have the right to consume as much of the food chain as we are able to. And since we have no apex predator chasing us around, we can view every living entity as possible prey to meet our insatiable demands. Although these stories are hard to hear, and they were hard to write, I want to say that reading Ed Young's book gave me great hope. There are so many scientists and organizations who are studying all of these issues and are proposing changes. For example, the New York Audubon Society reached out to the Tribute and Light organizers and explained the impact that the artificial light would have on migratory birds. The two organizations worked together to come up with a plan to save the birds. They now monitor the number of birds who are in the beams of light. And when more than a thousand birds are seen circling, they turn off the tribute lights for about 20 minutes to allow the birds to continue their journey. It was a beautiful and effective solution. My goal today was to increase awareness, empathy, and respect for our animal neighbors. Behavior change would be a bonus and would have benefits for us humans as well. So here are some options to consider. We could choose nighttime lighting at our building and at our homes that avoids excessive brightness. We could avoid poison as a way of removing wayward mice. We could reduce our use of plastic, especially near rivers or oceans. We could eat vegetarian or vegan more of the time. We could support sustainable farms. We could advocate for responsible land management and the creation of wildlife corridors that connect fragmented habitats and so on. Our UU seventh principle says it all for me, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Coexistence is important and necessary in order for the earth to stay in balance. Humans have a responsibility to pay more attention to how that web appears to be working for our animal neighbors. So as we celebrate Earth Day, let us appreciate this immense world and let us honor it and cherish it. May it be so. Please stay seated for our closing hymn, swimming to the other side, and join Reed on the chorus. Spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. I'm alone and I am searching, hungering for answers in my time. I am balanced at the brink of wisdom. I'm impatient to receive a sign. I move forward with my senses open. Imperfection, it'll be my crime. In humility, I will listen. We're all swimming to the other side. Cause we are living beneath the great big dipper. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together, some in power and some in pain. We can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. On this journey through thoughts and feelings, binding intuition, my head, my heart, I am gathering the tools together. I'm preparing to do my part. All of those who have come before me, band together and be my guide. Loving lessons that I will follow, we're all swimming to the other side. We are living beneath the great big dipper. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together, some in power and some in pain. We can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. 
when we get there, we'll discover all of the gifts we've been given to share have been with us since life's beginning. We never noticed that they were there. We can balance at the brink of wisdom, never recognizing what we've arrived. Loving spirits will live together. We're all swimming to the other side. We are living beneath the great big dipper. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together, some in power and some in pain. We can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. We are living neath the Great Big Dipper. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together, some in power and some in pain. We can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. Our closing benediction is from Victorian art critic John Ruskin. The greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something. To see clearly is poetic, prophecy, and religion all in one. We join together in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please rise and body our spirit and with your hands over your heart, holding the hand of those next to you or whatever posture is most comfortable for you, we sing words of blessing one to another.